Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is John Hiller. Let me tell you about what we have going on at Centenary. Today, after church, we have our chili cook-off hosted by the United Methodist Men. So I hope that you will stay and join us for lunch. All donations go to support the ministries of United Methodist Men. Tonight at 5.30, our youth group will meet here at the church. And tomorrow is our trunk or treat. We will set up in the west parking lot at the church, decorate your trunk, come and give out candy to our trick-or-treaters, or come by and trick-or-treat. There is some extra candy here at the church available to hand out. On Wednesday, we have Logos at 4.30, and that's for children of youth at all ages, and it meets here at the church. Our church council will be meeting Tuesday, November the 1st in preparation for charge conference. And our charge conference meets at the church Monday, November the 14th. Next Sunday, November 6th, will be our first Sunday with our new pastor, James Graham. And we'll have a special worship schedule at 9.30 is our traditional service. Our contemporary service will meet at 11.15. And at 10.30, we'll have a reception for James and his wife, Nancy, in the Welcome Center. And next Sunday is also All Saints Day. So it's a big day in the life of the church as we remember those who have gone on before us and welcome our new pastor and the ministry that is ahead of us. So I hope that you will join us. And now, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. Today we are welcoming a guest preacher, Janice Sharp. Uh, you might know her by another name. She is uh, one of your own, grew up here at Centenary. Uh, so glad that she is come. Uh, she gave me a full vacation. I was on vacation this last week, and since she agreed to preach today, I didn't have to write a sermon on vacation. So we're very thankful for Janice. Uh, sharing uh, a word with us today. After the worship service today, we'll have the uh, United Methodist Men's Chili Cook-Off. Just move down the hall, follow the smell of chili, and you will be there. I hope that you can stay and join us for that. Uh, and we're going to be starting our worship service today with a special treat, our Logos Children's Choir. So would you please welcome our Children's Choir.
Please stand for the choral call to worship. <laughs> join together our hearts and voices in the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. The hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Please remain standing as we reaffirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, as the forgiven and reconciled children of God, let us share signs of the peace of Christ with one another.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for this opportunity to gather together in your presence and to offer you our worship. We give you thanks for this community, this congregation that we're a part of. We give you thanks for the ways that we support one another, care for one another, and love one another. All of that a reflection of the love you first had for us. We pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and strengthen us for the ministries that you have called us to do. Feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, eating with sinners, being your presence in a hurting world. We pray for our community, for places that don't yet look like your kingdom, where there is hunger, where there is loneliness and isolation and despair. We pray for those who do not have shelter, those whose needs are not met, and pray that through the generosity of your people and the strength of your power, you would transform their lives and meet them where they are. We pray for our world Where there is violence, we pray for peace, for your transforming love to break through, to bring an end to suffering and to war, to heal broken relationships. We pray for our leaders that you would give them wisdom, wisdom that comes from looking at the world through your eyes seeing each and every person as one of your children. We pray, God, for those among us who are suffering from illnesses and from injury and ask that you would restore them to wholeness, that you would strengthen those who give them care. We pray for those who are mourning, that your peace would be with them and that you would walk with them day by day. And whatever other prayers are on our hearts, even the prayers that we can't find words for, we turn them over to you, trusting that you hear us when we pray. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We are. We are. We are the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church, 179 years strong, in partnership with our brothers and sisters in the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, out of whom we have our birth. We are the Oklahoma Conference. 408 chartered churches. Five mission churches. Two ecumenical ministries. Six new church starts. And six satellites. In 76 of our 77 counties. Making disciples and transforming the world by transforming our communities. We are the Wichita's Lake Country, Green Country, Council Oak, Northern Prairie, Cimarron, Crossroads, and Heartland. We are Deacons, Local Pastors, Elders, Supply and Lay Pastors, Lay Servants and Lay Speakers. We are 15 campus ministries. Wesley Foundations, as they are more commonly known, a Christian presence on campus. We are three beautiful campsites, Cross Point, Egan, and Canyon, creating sacred spaces where God changes lives. We are three urban ministries remembering the least, last, and lost. We are foster care and advocacy for children. We are walk to Emmaus communities and academies for spiritual formation. Youth and young adult ministries. Project Transformation and Impact OK2. We are. We are. Academies. Cohorts. Apprentices. Residents. And interns. We are. Higher education. Dental and eye clinics. Community gardens. Food pantries. Clothing closets. Rental assistance. And so much more. We are. United Women in Faith, a sisterhood acting in faith to tackle the hard work of the world without hesitation. And United Methodist Men, coaching men to thrive through Christ so others may know Christ. We are rural, urban, suburban, inner city, and open field, men and women, young and old, all searching to be more like Christ each day. In Sunday school, youth groups, small groups, nursing home ministries, and helping those recover from addictions which can paralyze. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are building our future together. Growing in faith. Creating disciples. Sharing our story. Loving our neighbors and transforming the world in big and small ways. The Lord is our chosen portion and our cup. The boundary lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. We have a goodly heritage. Therefore, our hearts are glad and our souls rejoice. You show us the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. We are, we are thankful for our heritage hopeful in the present, looking to build a future together as United Methodists in Oklahoma. In a great affirmation of the church and scripture, what we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Thanks be to God that we are on a journey which leads us to Christ as we become Christ's light in this world. We are. We are. Yes, we are. This is a video that uh, was put together by the Oklahoma Annual Conference and shown at our most recent annual conference to remind us of the connection that we have with United Methodists all across the state, doing ministry, uh, sharing Christ's love, proclaiming the good news in the communities around us. When you give here, you're not just giving to support the local ministries of this church, but it goes beyond uh, through the conference to support ministries around the state and indeed across the world. Will you join me as we bless these gifts? Gracious God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you pour out upon us. 
We turn some of those back to you now. May they be used for the building of your kingdom in this place and around the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. John Hiller. Um, I've known John since he was quite young. Um, I don't know if you remember, we ran into each other at different places, um, and know his family well, and uh, just have enjoyed getting to work with him now um, as he pastors and as a part of this church. And thank you for uh, receiving me this morning. I look out and see some faces that I remember well. Um, my name says Janice Sharp in there, but some of you may remember me as Janice Meese. Uh, Genevieve and Al were my in-laws a few years ago. I've been gone for about 30, 30 years. Um, and remembering so much about this church, um, the windows, always the wonderful choir. I did forget how high up this chancel was. I feel like I'm a, you know, up at elevation um, remembering my definition of call um, right at that spot at Communion one Easter Sunday, remembering um, working with youth, wish some of them were here, because um, I would tell on them the time when we were doing the ropes out at the mountains, and they picked me up and threw me over the climbing wall. Thank goodness I was much younger and much more flexible in those days. Remembering... Um, Standing um, with the pastor here as babies were baptized. 
being a part of this church and then going forth from this church. And so again, I thank you. It's taken me a while to get back here, but uh, it's a glorious thing that it is, um, it's here today. My husband is also a pastor. He preaches at Marlowe First, and that's where he is today. I was asked where, where he was, and he's working. Um, I get to be here today because I retired this year, um, and there's some great joy in that. And at the same time, there's some, um, a little bit of dissonance in my heart. Uh, after serving for as long as I did and being a part of so many congregations, the joy that I felt um, in doing so. Would you pray with me? Most gracious and holy God, we are thankful that your spirit is here with us today in this room, in this place. And now may it guide every word, every thought, every moment as we turn to worship you. Amen. I'm reading the text from Matthew 16, beginning with the 13th verse. Now, when Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he said sternly, he ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're all modernists, right? We live in modern times. We enjoy modern things. But think about it, I mean, those times actually began around the 18th century. They were part of the Enlightenment. And it's characterized by a lot of change. I mean, everything changed from the way we thought about culture to the way that uh, we had all these gains in science. The more we understood about the world, the more it influenced the way that we thought and the way that we lived. Science was this great thing. Modern times brought all this newness to it. And not only did modern thinking improve our lives, but it also influenced our religious beliefs. Have you ever thought about that, how modernity kind of encroached on everything? Our theological emphasis was impacted by our respect for science and what it told us. Our world was growing smarter. And we all wanted to be a part of that. We wanted to be intellectual. We wanted to reflect those abilities to think and share everything that we had learned. Now, giving credit where credit is due, science did give us so much. From the first steam engines to uh, computers that control everything today, I can't live without mine. My phone is a permanent attachment, it feels like. But science also remove some things. Because we began to think about science in such serious ways that we decided that if we could not prove something, it did not exist. It wasn't real. And so we started throwing out some things. So much for virgin birth, so much for resurrection, and even the divinity of the man whose lives was bookend by those two events. Jesus, well, Jesus became a prophet, a model of compassion and righteousness, but he was, well, he was just a man. 
because we couldn't prove anything more than that. There was clear and certain doubt. During my doctrinal work, I took this class called Toward a Global Christ. It was disturbing. It was, it was challenging. It was provoking. And I loved it because it made me think about the Jesus, not just the Jesus I knew, but the Jesus that was the Jesus for everyone. And that was different. The class also introduced postmodernity to me and made me think like a postmodern person. All of a sudden, modernity was no more. There was this new era, and it, it questions everything. We're living in postmodern times now. The truth becomes what I make truth out to be. In other words, my truth, your truth, everyone's truth is in the eye of the beholder. That is scary for me. But it also made me make, have this other kind of leap that my truth didn't have to depend on science. That I could go beyond that and I could let other things inform my life, like my life, like the events of my life, like the people I knew, and my spirituality. And those are the things that began to shape my beliefs. Think about Jesus. <laughs> this is the Jesus that I grew up with. You all know this Jesus. Probably hanging somewhere in this church, right? This is the Head of Christ by Warner Salmon. And this has been my reality for as long as I can remember. Since childhood, this was Jesus for me. But I've seen other portraits. You may have seen this one as well. This is the Laughing Jesus by Reverend Ellen Wallace Douglas. We often think of Jesus as so serious. But I like to imagine Jesus as being with friends, being with loved ones, and sharing things that are incredible to those who knew him well. This next picture is a more of a stretch for Jesus. Although Jesus said, clearly, let the children come to me, this... <laughs> This painting by Harvey Gilman is, uh, well, it's pure imagination, right? But to me it says there's no place in my life where Jesus is not present. This is the eldest known art depicting Jesus. It's graffiti from Rome. It's hard to see, I know, but see there in the center you can see a donkey-headed figure being crucified. Can you see that? And then off to the side, you see a man standing. This was literally carved into a wall around the first century in Rome. If you're feeling confused and offended by its content, it's because it was created in a time when Jesus was not being celebrated. Instead, here he's being mocked. Christianity was not a recognized religion, and most Roman citizens looked upon its practitioners with some suspicion, some skepticism. And this graffiti was telling that story. It's, it was made actually to make fun of the man that's standing off to the side, Alexandros. It, it says, there's an inscription below, and it says, Alexandro worshiping his god. Yeah, this donkey-headed figure saying that Christians are that foolish, that that's who they would worship. And then there's this final picture, one that you might have seen some time ago. It was in the spring of 2005. Have you seen this picture? National Geographic did a special on the real Jesus. Anybody remember that? The scientists took the skull of a Middle Eastern Jewish man from about 2,000 years ago. And with the forensics of the day, they built up muscle and tissue and skin and hair until he appeared much as he would have 2,000 years ago. And then they had the audacity to tell us, this is probably closer to what Jesus actually, how he appeared in that time. Dark-skinned, dark hair, short, stocky, muscular. 
and yet looking at this guy, anybody here find him really attractive? <laughs> and yet far more likely a truer representation than some of the other pictures I showed. So who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Political ideologue, white guy, liberal prophet, personal assistant. What does Jesus mean to you when you call out his name? I've heard all kinds of answers, sometimes terrific, sometimes fun, sometimes maybe even a little embarrassing. Because you see, it's not uncommon for us to desire Jesus to be something from our own personal perspective. We want Jesus to match what we want, what we need at any given time. We want Jesus to make us feel good. And yet Matthew's telling us the most important thing to know is something simple. The words that Peter says, Jesus is the Christ. He's our Messiah. He's the Son of God. We can say these words about Jesus, but still never know the implication. What does it mean to have an, a Messiah? We can live our lives as Christians and never confess that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. It's easy to do. And we can believe we know Jesus without ever realizing that Jesus is the revelation of God. You might think that you know him, but do you know the Jesus of difficult words, of hard times? Do you know the Jesus of the cross? so often project onto Jesus our cultures, our doctrines, and even our science. He was a good guy, but that's it. But the question lingers, and it's important for us to get it right now. Right now in this time, it has become just crucial that we figure out Jesus. Why? Because the church is being tossed and thrown and asked all these questions. And this is the one we've got to get right. We're tempted. We're tempted to believe that Jesus and the church rests on our logic, maybe our metaphysics, and yes, yes, the things that we believed a hundred years ago. But what happened in the meantime? What happened to our spirituality? I uh, remember standing downstairs, it was Logos. Anybody here remember uh, Louise English? Maybe a few, yeah, a few voices. So I'm getting ready to leave. I'm heading off to seminary, and Louise walks up to me and says, don't lose, <laughs> yeah, don't lose your faith. I thought, how odd, I'm going to seminary, that's what it's all about. But I think I figured out sometime later to hang on to that spiritual nature that God gives us all. And it's so easy to lose, especially in times when it wraps around all these other needs and developments and fears. Because our relationship with Jesus rests on our spirituality. We want to know the truth. We want to know what Peter shares. That's our nature. He answers, he answers in truth, and it's still the truth. And while I said that postmodernity about, is about everybody's different truths, this is one thing we can share and need to share. He says simply, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then he tells reader, uh, Peter that he's the rock on which the church will be built. But he's really not talking to Peter. He's talking about what Peter just said. The words Peter said are the rock of the church because Jesus is pointing to the fact that it's not about Peter's strength or who he is or how smart he is. It's about 
it's not about his accomplishments. It's not about his strength. And, and the good thing is it's not about those things today. It's not about your accomplishments or your strengths. It is about the witness and perhaps the witness that we've lost. You are the Christ, and the world needs that today. They need to hear. They are desperate to hear that they have somebody who loves them as they are. They have somebody who accepts them where they are. They have somebody who fills in them all the needs, all the doubts, all the losses. Because what God did was to come to us in the flesh as a Jew from Nazareth named Jesus, or more hebraically named Joshua, meaning God saves. And we believe that the, the particular way God saves, the way God gets to us is Jesus. And when we lose that, we lose our foundation. We lose who we are. This astounding claim about this carpenter's son who was born of a virgin, lived brief, brief, briefly, died violently in his 30s, and then rose from the dead unexpectedly. You have not been forced to believe that. You're given the freedom to believe that because that's God's way. And when you think about it, who would you choose as a savior? I sat down and thought about it, maybe a little bit with uh, my tongue in my cheek. Um, so I would like Jesus to look like George Clooney. I would like Jesus to have the money and the power of Bill Gates and the brilliance of Stephen Hawking. Wouldn't that be a great combination? But that's not Jesus. Not somebody who just gives us what we want. Even though what we want may be great things. Freedom from oppressors. A warrior-like leader. Somebody who's strong and, and determined with, with followers who are made up of people that, well, they're more like a Make-A-Wish Foundation than that ragtag group that actually followed Jesus. But instead what we got was this man who said that the poor are precious, who said that Caesar isn't God despite what he says, and that money doesn't buy your way into heaven. We got a man who just made people mad, didn't he? We also got a man who was killed in the end. And for so many, they were shocked because that was God's plan. You know, time and again, Jesus said things I wish he hadn't. Things like, hate your mother, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And to be honest, you know, I, I read those things and I know exactly what he meant, which makes it even more difficult. And I know that Jesus can be hard and frustrating and unpopular, especially if we claim him as the Lord of our life. But I know what happens when we doubt also. Doubt means giving up and walking away. Doubt means, ah, eh, what does it matter anyway? Doubt means, so many things. We're all filled with doubt today, doubt about the crazy economy, doubt about politics that scare me to death, doubt about our relationships in this world. They're hard to keep and hold on to. I love what Gabron said about this. Doubt is, is a pain too lonely to know that faith is his twin brother. And I would remind you today that that twin, that faith, rests in our spirituality. Our openness to God, our openness to one another, our openness to feeling 
Anybody here besides me, when we started this morning, opened up and just felt the Spirit descend in this room? The Spirit's here. That's how your spirituality informs you. Opening to you new ways, new truths, new life, and the things that we desperately need. Hope for tomorrow, faith in things to come. truth, a truth that is a simple witness that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. We gather together as a community who have put our faith in Jesus man from Nazareth who God sent long ago to remind us that God is with us. If you would like to commit to following him today, recommit to following him this day, join in the work of this congregation and continuing the ministry of Jesus in the world. As we stand together and sing this next song, I invite you to come forward to reaffirm your faith, to join this congregation in baptism, or if there is something that you require prayer for this day in the support and love of this congregation, we invite you to come and receive that. However the Holy Spirit is leading you, I invite you to respond as we stand and sing. Hope you will stay and join us for a chili lunch hosted by the Methodist men. The proceeds from lunch go towards their ministries of uh, feeding and witness in this community. Uh, youth group meets tonight at 5.30. And next Sunday is our first Sunday with our new senior pastor, James Graham. Traditional worship will be at 9.30. Repeat after me. Traditional worship will be at 9.30. Very good. There'll be a reception for James and his wife Nancy in the Welcome Center after that worship service at 1030. And then the contemporary worship service, the Refuge, will meet in the Activity Center at 1115. 1115? 1115. All right. And then after that, we're back to everybody meeting at 1050 in two spaces. Okay. i got to okay. jump in, John, and tell you all that I know James personally. He's an incredible man. You're going to be blessed. Um, he is so pastoral. He's a great administrator. He is um, hes just a great guy, and you're going to enjoy just getting to know him personally. So I hope you welcome him um, because I've already told him you're a great church. Which he's right. <laughs> Will you join me now in the sending forth? Grant, O Lord, that what has been said with our lips we may believe in our hearts. And that what Amen.
Amen. Amen.